he was hired to come to work at Crossroads where I was working as the on-site counselor, but Alan got fired after two weeks of being there for very inappropriate behavior. And so I completely, uh, I gave him the benefit of the doubt initially when he switched to work uh, with this project that Mark mentioned. Um, but after a few weeks, I completely chose to disengage. So I just wanted to put that out there. I have no connection whatsoever to this therapist that he mentioned. And aside from that, I really wanted to start out by going back to a point that Garrett uh, made in his, in his talk. And that is that uh, people are always looking for love and acceptance. And um, as I study human development and I look at you know, what drives people to take substances, um, at the core of that is this idea of um, something called attachment theory. And you know, when we look at the, at the evolutionary trajectory of, of our species, our number one strategy for survival became bonding and connecting with one another. And so uh, there's a really interesting concept called the evolutionary mismatch of opioid addiction. And basically what that gets at is that um, because our particular strategy for survival is bonding and connection, and that's mediated by endorphins and oxytocin, and opioids mimic the effect of, uh, of endorphins. Um, it's really, it's really interesting to see that perhaps that is one of the reasons why opioid addiction is so hard to treat and to overcome because it's hacking a system that's very, very old, evolutionary speaking, and that heck carries a lot of value. So um, I guess I would like to put out there this idea so that all of the people that work with Ibergain, I don't know if it's part of your um, protocol or part of your assessment as you're we're trying to decide who is an eligible candidate for a treatment or not, I think it would be really important to assess what kind of situation this person is going to be going back to. You know, like, do they have, do they have a community? Uh, I don't know if I'm cutting off. Um, yeah, Annie, you, you, we just lost the last bit a little bit. Okay. Um, so I don't know what was the last thing that you guys were able to hear. But um, I guess I'll just switch over to really address this topic of 5-MeO. So I came to Crossroads in 2013, and I started to implement this, this protocol of administering 5-MeO uh, DMT uh, extracted from the Bufo um, that I had collected myself over uh, the summer of 2012. And initially, my rationale for bringing in the use of 5-MeO was that I kept seeing that while Ibergain worked wonders in terms of interrupting withdrawals and really minimizing cravings and creating a window of opportunity for people to put uh, a plan in place so that um, by the end of the three months after Nor Ibergain gets out of their system, that they would be sort of on a, on an, en route towards creating a new healthy lifestyle. Um, but I also saw that the Ibergen experience itself was very tolling and very, uh, very challenging. And because of the personal work that I had done with 5 Mio back in Mexico, uh, I sort of arrived at this idea that the energetic signature of the experience with 5 Mio is one of infinite connection and unconditional love. So I tried to reason, you know, what would happen if people that have just sat through an Ibergain experience and done an extensive live review of every little awful thing they've done, you know, Garrett made a comment about how when you start, when you get on the path of, of heavy drugs, you, you reach a point where you do awful things to your family and your friends and the people that you care about the most that you would normally wouldn't do. And so, you know, I, I figure what would happen if people have access to this, uh, want to this really powerful connecting experience in terms of resetting and um, you know yeah resetting all that negativity that they had to sit with and and I think that reasoning was was good was solid but in most recent times I've actually started to think well what if what if that uh, level of difficulty of the ivory experience itself is part of the therapeutic impact that it can have for people to really start making different choices. 
And um, there's already been brought up in the audience, you know, some concerns about our contraindications. Is it really safe? Uh, ibogaine has a really complex pharmacological process. How are, you know, how are you adding something on top of that in such a short window of time? And so in most recent months and the last couple of years, actually, I've thought about how it might make more sense to not completely discard out the idea of adjunct treatments with ibogaine, but really give ibogaine a chance, and, and particularly nor ibogaine, that you know it's the active metabolite that stays uh, stored in their in their fat cells for up to three months. I never really did uh, official outcome studies at either Crossroads or Chipsa, but I would follow up with people very informally, just over email and over the phone. And pretty consistently, what I saw was that people did great for the first three months, uh, but then at the three-month mark, they sort of hit a wall and relapse started to happen. And I could tell because they were no longer answering my calls or responding to my emails. So, um, you know, I have this, this sort of interesting idea uh, that I'd like to put out there you know, it would be really wonderful if ibogaine treatments were sort of structured in the way where um, they come for ibogaine, but you kind of stay in, in touch with them. And uh, at the three month mark, when we know that there's a high risk for relapse, that then, and that then they do the adjunct therapies, whether it's 5-MeO, DMT, or psilocybin, or whatever practitioner, practitioners are using. Um, but that can serve as a little, um, catalyst that can help people stay on the path that they're on, continue to build their sense of self-efficacy of, oh my God, I've got this, I've been clean for three months and I can keep going. Um, so just, just a thought uh, around that. And um, somebody in the audience mentioned something about early childhood trauma. And one of the most particular things that I saw in the three years that I work with 5-MeO DMT in the context of an ibogaine treatment, a lot of people came with trauma, some veterans, some people uh, with just other, other, other type of PTSD, not combat related. Um, but whenever people had some kind of trauma during the 5-MeO DMT experience, what would happen is that some part of their body, sometimes their jaw, sometimes their legs, sometimes their, their abdomen, it would just start to shake uncontrollably. And um, as I mentioned, I'm really, I'm really interested and fascinated by evolutionary psychology. And when we look at the evolution of the nervous system, and more specifically, the evolution of the autonomic nervous system, there's a really interesting theory called the polyvagal theory, which I actually discovered because of an ibogaine paper that was trying to tease out why there is this risk for cardiac arrest. And so um, the autonomic nervous system uh, has like three different levels of hierarchical organization. And the most recent one is what they call social engagement system. And this is how we connect with one another through nonverbal communication, like attuning to our uh, gestures and expressivity in our faces. And then if we go back in time, the next, the next uh, level is our, um, our sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight response. When we feel threatened in the environment, our nervous system is mobilized to either flee or fight. Um, but if we go backwards even more, our oldest system is called the immobilization system. And this is what you see when you go to a pet store. This is what you see with reptiles. They just immobilize if they feel threatened by something. So uh, what this paper was getting at is that it seems that when, when there is some cardiac situation in an ibogaine treatment is because that really, really old circuit of our autonomic nervous system has been triggered and the person has gone into immobilization. So the heart stops. Uh, so with the 5-MeO DMT, what happens is when there's, uh, this is, this is kind of what I saw and this is my, my hypothesis is that when, when there is trauma in a, in a person's body, uh, you know, it's lodged in the body. It's not just in the brain, it's in the body. And so the, the substance seems to uh, initiate a process of what I call somatic reprocessing. So all that tension or all that stress that somehow built up in the body is released through the experience. And so uh, I think it's really important to pay attention to those, to those uh, diagnoses of trauma when you're working with, with 5-MeO DMT, because as the person in the audience suggested, uh, if a person has just started to sort of embody and then you take them out, they, they, there can be serious consequences. Um, so those are the couple of stats that I wanted to share. Um, 
And, you know, it's interesting, I, when I moved to Baja with just a tiny little container of toad venom, I never thought that it would catch on the way it has. And now I have some real concerns because, as Claire mentioned earlier, there's like 17 clinics in Baja, and I'm pretty sure they're probably all doing 5-MeO-DMT, and I don't know how they're getting their toad venom. You know, like I would like to ask Mark, how how is he getting his toad venom? Are you collecting it yourself? Are you buying it? Because... Uh, and this is where we get to ecological uh, precariousness with the toads, much like with Ibogaine. It's interesting to see how in our effort to want to uh, help people, we've developed this really huge blind spot for, uh, for the plants themselves, or in this case, the, the, uh, the amphibian. Uh, because I'm from Sonora, and when I go back there every summer, I see the chaos that has kind of sprung up because either locals are collecting it so that they can sell it by the gram or people are coming from outside of Mexico and uh, they're like drawing a lot of attention to the toads which makes the locals see the toad as a com commodity and so they'll go and they put them in buckets and they'll, they'll stand outside of their house and wait for people to come by and sell it. So it's kind of a huge mess. And um, the last thing I want to mention is that, unfortunately, there is really no indigenous tradition associated with the use of fire meal. Somebody in the audience made a comment about, you know, what kind of training? Well, there really isn't. Um, I think clinicians, uh, just from their therapy background, uh, might, are the best equipped to, to deal with whatever might come up. But as far as indigenous traditions, there really isn't one. And... Yeah, uh, I, I have one question for Zbea. I'm fascinated by orthomolecular medicine. Uh, I, I'm, I just wonder if there are any sort of contraindications with ibogaine, just because of how complex, you know, even eating grapefruit before you take ibogaine could prove fatal. So how do you draw the line between what's safe and what isn't uh, as you're trying to optimize uh, treatment outcomes? Well, I am sure Claire would be more, uh, but she's not here, <laughs> better to, to answer that question. But yes, grapefruit is uh, not possible. But otherwise, for all the other things, they I don't see any contraindications. And uh, the one I am using during the treatment itself is only the, the GABA supplement, so of course magnesium, and also GABA or itself or L-glutamine, because I really felt in my own ebogonite that if when I, I forgot to take the GABA, uh, that uh, my mental activity was much more active. It's and then I took it along with the route, and it was really easier to dive into the, the effect. Uh, I've got something to add about the 5-MEO. Um, I've been working with 5-MEO now for uh, a long time. I've never used Toad. And the, the 5-MEO that, that I'd been using had come from uh, a friend who was stocked. Um, and we were using uh, HCL, and we use that insufflated. We snort that, which is quite a different way of, of working with that medicine. And just mm -hmm. recently, uh, a huge batch has come out of Holland, which uh, has sent out free base 5-MEO, five because there was a drought for a few years. And that drought is just now over. So, so there's a lot of free base 5-MEO, which is now in circulation, which can save the toad. Wonderful. And Garrett, what is the route of administration uh, that you use uh, in your treatments? Is it smoked or uh, insufflated? Um, it's a, it's a smoked, either smoked or insufflated. When we've been working in circles, it's been insufflated. When I've been using it after uh, treatment, it's been smoked. Mm -hmm. A and I, I also do that very, very lightly when I work with it. I, mm -hmm. you know, I think in lighter doses than, than other people have done. But that was my Thank main point now is that the toad is, is being saved by a, a, a fabulous chemist in Holland. Yeah, it's a very easy molecule to synthesize. Very simple. Um, Annie, we're going to wrap up now for questions. So do you have okay. anything else you'd like to say, or should we move on to questions now? We can move on to questions. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so have. much. Thank you.
Are you in Madison? Me? Annie, yeah. Are you in Madison? I'm in Madison, yeah. Oh. Well, there are a few people that I might introduce you to. Oh, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> okay, does anyone have any questions? I was wondering uh, the difference between NNDMT versus 5-MeO-DMT for the, just in general, what your opinion is on that. Oh, f uh, for Anna, right? Anna? Oh, oh, um, thanks. I was just wondering the difference uh, well, between using NNDMT as opposed to 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, what is your opinion on that? You know, even though structurally speaking, they're almost identical, um, their profile in terms of the subjective experience that they produce is quite different. Um, DMT, doesn't matter who you are, you're going to have a, a very visual experience that may or may not have any meaningful content for you. Um, whereas 5-MeO DMT may not even produce a visual experience, but whatever comes up tends to be quite meaningful. Um, and so, and, and I think that's what kind of adds to the therapeutic value. So uh, I've never really worked with NMDMT. Um, I know it's very visual and um, that it's incredibly therapeutic when you, when you consume it in, a, in its oral form as ayahuasca. Um, but when you smoke it, it's, it's such a short experience and, and so bright and, and uh, wild that I think it's hard for people to even take out bits of pieces that can be integrated into any sort of cohesive meaning. Great. Thank you very much. You're so um, this question is for, for anyone on the panel and, and, and Annie. Um, I just wonder if sometimes uh, there's a tendency by providers to want to administer more medicine, whether it's adjunctive medicines like 5-MeO or people doing boosters, and that can be important, but there's also the question of body work. Uh, some of the providers I've worked with have emphasized body work as part of their adjunctive, and, and also the issue of good psychotherapy and counseling, both you know pre- and post-administration, and you know, does that become a risk trying to rely too heavily on medicines instead of some of these other important um, adjuncts to Ibogaine administration? Doug, I really appreciate your question. And um, absolutely, you know, I think that there needs to be heavy, heavier um, uh, attention to therapy and integration. And, and not so much on just the medicines. Unfortunately, I may be very popular for saying this, but a lot of the clinics down in Baja just make it so that, uh, you know, we'll offer this and this and that just so that you go to their clinic and not the clinic down the street. And, and that really sort of compromises uh, the patient's wellness because somebody that might not be really uh, a candidate uh, gets offered this and then they say, well, you said that you would give it to me. So then they're in a, in a, in a bind and they have to follow through when uh, you're absolutely right. There's other uh, somatic therapies and, and uh, body work that can help with the integration process. And um, maybe Zvea as a psychologist might have more to add on that. And Garrett as a long time provider also. Yes, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, and of course I, I didn't say it maybe more precisely, but I would never uh, give uh, microdoses without the coaching that goes with it. It's always with uh, coaching and uh, sometimes it's with me and sometimes it's with other therapists because I know the person too much or something like that. And <laughs> I, so I'm very happy uh, to be here also to connect with other therapists that I can now uh, direct people to. I also work with this uh, Being True To You network sometimes and I give to them clients. And um, one thing that I, I didn't say maybe also, which can give ideas to people, the way I'm, I'm doing it with um, people with addiction is that sometimes I, I 
Well, most often I tell them I don't do the treatment if afterwards you don't have a real plan to go out of your environment. And if uh, and a lot of times I advise people to, to do volunteer work abroad with the coaching, of course, with always a long-term relationship with someone. And it's it's been helping people, you know, to go out of their environment, to work as a voluntary uh, on a voluntary basis, so to have the satisfaction of doing something, and also, of course, to be in nature and and, and in good places. Uh, yeah, I always um, there's always got to be a really good plan. I I never tell when somebody asks first calls, um, you know, it's not just I began and that's it. You know, there's got to be a really good plan in place. And I'm working with uh, various therapists or aftercare centers. Uh, never do I say, oh, yeah, come on down. I'll give you Ibogaine and, you know, and that's it. And, and the 5-MEO only gets given to certain pe pe people. I, you know, I, I, I also rely on my intuition about that, you know. And, and uh, this whole thing is not cookie cutter anyhow, you know. And so it varies from, from client to client. But it's definitely a lot more than just I began. You know, people stay for two weeks with us, so it's and just one person. So there's a lot. There's body work, walks in nature, the whole this therapists. This is yeah, it's just not as simple as just taking medicine. Or that. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Um, that's it. No more time for questions. Right, we're going to have a group photo outside, um, smoking area. Let's record this for posterity. Thank you. And then 1.15, we'll start Ben's film. In here. Ben of the Taub variety, not the Delonin. <laughs>